Well, welcome this morning. Um, it's a strange experience for me preaching this morning because this is my last day uh, as part of the uh, ministry team here at Greenford Baptist Church. Um, and, and my my sermon today's got two titles, so you can you can pick which title you'd like. Okay, so it's the end bracket part two or the beginning. We're looking at Revelation chapter 22 uh, this morning. So if you've got a Bible, an app, um, postcard, whatever, uh, do have a look. We're going to do the whole chapter. We're going to jump over a few bits because um, there's not quite enough time to look at everything in the chapter this morning. So, uh, But I do want to cover uh, the chapter. So there'll be a few bits that we go over quite quickly. So just to remind you that... Um, the letter of Revelation, and it was a letter. It was sent to a number of churches in Asia, and uh, churches that John knew, that knew John, and it would have been read to the church during during worship. And uh, the context of the of the church is is that they were having a difficult time. It was not illegal to be a Christian, but if you were a Christian, you could find yourselves in difficulty with the courts. Um, you. A number of people had already been killed, other had been uh, imprisoned. And the core theme of Revelation is that whatever the appearance is, God is in control now and forever. Whatever the appearance, God is in control now and forever. That's the theme of Revelation all the way through. So, two weeks ago, who was here two weeks ago? About four people. Mm, I think some of you know what's coming next. I, I, I think that there's some hiding going on. Two weeks ago, we looked at chapter 21, didn't we? Do you remember that? Vaguely? One or two people? Yeah, yeah. And you may notice that chapter 22 comes immediately after chapter 21. So, it would be quite helpful to have a brief recap. So rather than me giving you a brief recap of what we looked at two weeks ago, I thought you could give me a brief recap. What do you think? Mm, yeah, we're going to do it anyway. Absolutely right. So um, what were some of the key things that we saw from chapter 21, those four of you who were admitted to being here um, two weeks ago? And anyone else that happens to remember? I'm glad you're here and I'm glad you're speaking. Um, we talked about what was going to be in heaven mm -hmm. and um, things that won't be there. Yeah. We talked about how it's as important what's not there as what is going to be there. Absolutely. Very good. Anything else? So that's half of the four people so far. Um, how God chose us, we accepted and responded and we'll be going to live with him forever. Amen. Fantastic. Anything else? The other two people? There's something else really important. Really important. That it's not actual um, as described. It's a symbol. Yeah. And that the symbols are really important. But also that the sea isn't there. <laughs> Yes, we talked about symbols last time. Remember, we talked about the fire exit sign. If we have to leave in an emergency, we don't get a ladder and try and climb out through the green box. We go through the door because the sign is not the thing. It stands for the thing. But there's something else really important, really, really, really important that we you haven't mentioned. So I'm a bit worried now. Are you going to speak? Yep. Oh, yeah, go on then. Go for it. Talked about the bride, which I thought was odd yep but it's something else something really 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 important uh that no sin will be there sin will be gone there'll be no tears there'll be no crying there'll be no pain it's just going to be us and god there'll be no earth or heaven anymore it's going to be just us and god all of that is absolutely true and absolutely fantastic but there's something else there's something else I think this is the fourth person who was here two weeks ago. Um, well, I've got loads of notes here, so I'm just going <laughs> to... 
Um, Shall I sit down while you read the notes? And there's no evil. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that's not, that's not the one. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> but you're absolutely right in heaven, there's no evil. Now, what, the, the, why the, the whole point of John writing to the churches in Asia was not so they knew the future. The whole point of John writing to the churches was to help them in how they live now. So the letter of Revelation, it is about the future, but it's, it's relevant to what we do now. It's about now. And so we are called to faithful lives now. That's what the challenge of Revelation is about. All of this fantastic stuff, yes, but it is about how we live our lives now that really matters. And that, strangely, is going to crop up again and again as we look through the passage today. Okay, so let's make a start. Remembering that all the things you read are symbols. The symbol is not the thing. The symbol stands for the thing. In the same way that the actual city is not 1,470 miles high, you know, it's, it's symbols. So, so the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit with a fresh crop each month. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. If you excuse the pun, the image of the river flows all the way from Genesis right the way through to Revelation. It's all the way through Scripture. This image of the water of life, the river with water of life. It's a continual image in Scripture. Remember, Jesus talked about the fountains of the water of life coming out of us and so on. The tree of life symbolized here, also you find in Genesis. And both of those images stand for eternal life. The abundant fruit, healing leaves, emphasize the complete absence of need. The point here is that all that was lost from God's original creation, all that he had intended for humankind, that humankind messed up at the beginning, is going to be restored. Every single thing. But in the new creation, there's going to be a couple of things missing. The tempter. That snake is imaged in Genesis. Won't be there. Nor will there be any human ideas, any clever humans who think they know better than God. That won't be there either. All will be as God intended. All will be perfect. As one writer put it, the new creation is the old creation as God intended it to be. Isn't that fantastic? God is amazing at actually putting things right that humans mess up, isn't he? Yeah. If I went around, there might be a few testimonies from your lives as well of things that you've messed up. But God has a way of redeeming. God has a way of turning around. God has a way of bringing good out of even the worst rubbish that we create. Amen? And here we see this on this massive scale. Let's go on. Verse 3. No longer will there be a curse upon anything. What about an amen? Amen. For the throne of God and the Lamb will be there. His servants will worship Him and they will see His face and His name will be written on their foreheads. And there will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun. For the Lord God will shine on them and they will reign forever and ever. No curses. You remember back in Genesis, the land was cursed. Curses came into the world because of what humankind had done. There will be no curses. His name will be written on every forehead. That's not that God's going to get some sharpie or felt pen and come and write Yahweh on each of your heads. It's, guess what? It's a symbol. 
What is a symbol of? It's about that every person in the new creation will reflect God's likeness. Every person who's going to be there will be fully committed to him. And we are going to see his face. Again, the face is a symbol. But you remember in, in Old Testament times, no one could see the face of God and live. Now, in the new creation, we are going to be seeing his face. It speaks of a completely open and transparent relationship with God. Isn't that amazing? We have just a taste of that now, just a little teeny, teeny taste. But there will be that openness, that intimacy. Remember we talked about the bride image last time and how that spoke of intimacy and closeness of relationship. That's how that's going to be with us. There's going to be no darkness there. Darkness, of course, being an image standing for anxiety and fear. You see, God's presence, to use an English expression, is going to fill every nook and cranny. There'll be nowhere there that's not filled by the 100% total presence of God. Nowhere. Amen? And so there'll be no fear, there'll be no anxiety, because it'll be 100% God absolutely everywhere. And there is this rather strange phrase that the people of God, us lot, are going to reign forever and ever. And it's a bit odd because you wonder exactly who we're going to be reigning over. But it's another image of actually being of the closeness between God and his people. Because we're going to share his throne. We're going to be with him. It's the whole imagery in Scripture about us being heirs. There is a time when we inherit fully, totally, 100%. And so at that point, that's where we arrive at. So I have a quote for you and then a question. So this is a guy and his name really, really is boring. I mean, that's his name. Uh, you know, that, that's his name. He wrote this. This picture does not attempt to offer, sorry, to answer speculative questions about the future. It is offered as an orientation for life in the present. Let me put that in other words. So these pictures here are not to try and tell us exactly what the future is going to be like because, as I said last time, what it's going to be like in heaven is be totally, utterly beyond human comprehension. So if God did explain it, we wouldn't understand it. So there are these images to help us. But it's not to satisfy our curiosity about the future. It is about the life in the present. So here's my question. How does what we've seen so far, last chapter, and what we've seen so far in this chapter, how does that affect the way that we live now? How should it affect the way that we live now, here in August 2019 in Greenford in West London? How does this that we've been reading this morning and we read last time, how should it affect the way that we live now? I fear it affects the way we live our life because we're no longer under the old nature. We're new in Christ and we should live by his infallible word of God the way he called us to live our lives on this earth as examples to do his work. Okay, thank you. I'm reminded by your famous saying, steak on the plate while we wait, not pie in the sky when we die. So it's heaven on earth. We, we want to... We want to sort of like, we, we can't grasp what, 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 uh, what we've got in store, but we can try to understand that. Get a flavor. A flavor. Mm -hmm. God's presence is with us now, not just when we go to heaven or whatever. 
we need to spread this news and share it to other people so they can experience it as well. Why should we do that, Steve? Because there's a heaven and there's a hell. So uh, we're able to save lives. This is about our destiny. I think this should give us an encouragement that we can live in, live in hope, even right, right here on earth. There's a, a song we sang earlier on, the one with the, um, that series of statements about God's miracle. Yeah, could you put that... Um, Chorus verse bit on the screen. There was a hand over here, but I've forgotten where it was. Um, I think it's also important to encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ and um, try to notice if they're falling and try and lift them up because it's not all just about me, me, me getting into heaven. We've got to try and help make sure that everybody in church gets to heaven as well. Very good. Very good. I, uh, I'm close. I'm a few weeks away from... It being 50 years since God turned up in a room, I'd never been to church, I'd never read the Bible, and I was there at about half past four on a Thursday afternoon in the middle of November, nearly 50 years ago, when God's presence filled the room. And I gave my life to God. There's a backstory to that which I'm not going to tell you today. When we sang this earlier on, um, just looking at these statements here, Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper, Light in the Darkness, my God, that is who you are. That's my testimony for 50 years. And part of the reason for me in holding on to God through all of that time is actually I know where I'm going. I know my destiny. I know my destiny. You've heard me talk many times about the fact that I like hiking and walking. In fact, we are tomorrow going to um, Ireland where we're doing an 81-mile walk. And we're not doing the 81 miles tomorrow, uh, just to explain. But over the next week and a bit, we're doing this 81-mile 81 81 mile walk. And, and the thing about, about hiking is that, uh, particularly th this is fairly flat, but we often uh, walk in, in the Alps and areas like that where there's an awful lot of up and down. You know, it, it, it is about getting a glimpse of where you're going that gives you the energy to get there. So this picture here, part of this, is to motivate us in how we live today. Because sometimes today is difficult, isn't it? There are some things that come our way that are hard, that are tough. Sometimes you can feel a bit low and discouraged. But actually it's a sense of these things are always true. And, th and we have a sense of where we're going in our destiny. So it changes how we see today. Let's read a bit more. Then the angel said to me, everything you've heard and seen is trustworthy and true. The Lord God who inspires his prophets has sent his angel to tell his servants what will happen soon. Look, I am coming soon. Blessed are those who obey the words of prophecy written in this book. We serve a God who chooses to make himself known. We serve a God who's chosen to reveal himself to us. We didn't set out to search for God. As I, as I sat in that room, I had never been looking for God. God came looking for me. And even if we think we found God because we're looking for him, it's only because he's been looking for us and has left us a trail. Because he's out looking for us even before. We're aware of him. He chooses to make himself known, make his purposes known. And that statement, look, I am coming soon. Blessed are those who obey the words of prophecy written in this book. It's designed to challenge us to obedience. Notice the word there, obey, by the way. Notice it doesn't say, blessed are those who know the words of prophecy written in this book. It doesn't say that. It's blessed are those who obey. It's not about what you know. And you can know the Bible inside out and backwards. As, as you know, I'm, I'm an academic theologian and, um, and practical theology. And, and uh, you know, I, sometimes I, 
I read stuff written about the Bible by people who aren't Christians. They know the Bible really well. But they don't know God. No relationship with God. No, no, I, no, no sense of who God is. So knowing about makes not, well, it's not unhelpful, but it doesn't transform our lives. So it's not that you know the prophecy, it's that you obey. It's that you do. Blessed are those who obey. Verse 8, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said, no, don't worship me. I'm a servant of God, just like you and your brothers and prof brothers the prophets, as well as, as all who obey, here it is again, what is written in this book, worship only God. Do you know, when something tips up in Scripture once, you take notice. When something appears twice, close together, you think, there's a very important point being made here. This is the second time in the book of Revelation that this event, an event like this takes place, where someone, where John falls down and worships, but it's not God. Why, what is the warning for the church today? Not what was the warning for the church then. What's the warning for us today? Because God's word is timeless. Amen? So it's there twice. It's something significant. So what is that warning about? It's at a crucial point in the book now. And the first time it happened was an absolutely crucial point in the book as well. So, or in the letter. So what's the point? What is this saying to us today? What do you think? That faith without works is dead. It's not on faith. Yeah, yeah, that's true. There's something else here as well. He's telling us to be obedient to his word and mm -hmm. to follow what God's telling us so it can be reality in our lives. Yeah, absolutely. Something else as well. I think he's telling us that we need to put our lives in order. Otherwise, we're going to miss out on what God is preparing for us. Absolutely true. Something else as well. I think we need to have that personal relationship with him, mm -hmm. where he's actually Lord of our lives, yes, and uh, um, we rely on him, we allow him to lead us into uh, what he has in store for us. Absolutely true. Fantastic. There's something else as well. There are so many things that uh, sometimes we mistake for God and we worship uh, when we should actually be focusing on God himself. Absolutely. Hole in one. This is about, there is a danger for us. And I, I see it sometimes in, in church, uh, I don't mean Green for Baptist Church, in church in general, where um, sometimes here the messenger, hear this carefully, the messenger, the angel, is mistaken for God. And we need to be very careful in the way, you know, our relationship is with God alone. And we need to be careful no matter how convincing the messenger is the church leader the pastor anybody else it is God alone that we serve it's God alone that we worship and sometimes there is a risk a danger and I've, I've been in churches right it has been my opinion that this has been the case in those churches where actually the pastor or a church leader is actually getting Effectively praise and worship from people within the church. And it's God alone that we serve. It's God alone that we worship. It's, it's, it's not the messenger. It is God alone. No matter how wonderful and godly and miracle working and saintly the messenger may be, we worship only God. Anything else, 
the Bible calls idolatry. Verse 10. Then he instructed me, do not seal up the prophetic words in this book, for the time is near. Let the one who is doing harm continue to do harm. Let the one who is vile continue to be vile. Let the one who is righteous continue to live righteously. Let the one who is holy continue to be holy. Do not seal up the prophetic words in this book, for the time is near. This is a reference back to the prophet Daniel in the Old Testament who was told to seal the prophecy because there was a long time until the end. The point here is that the end is imminent. Uh, You might observe that this was written 2,000 years ago. So here's the question, was John wrong? You say that confidently. He says... The time is near. The time is imminent. Jesus is recorded here saying, I am coming soon. That was 2,000 years ago. Was he wrong? Mm, Okay, I'm I'm with the no, but I think there's a no because that will be quite handy at this point in time. Mainly because God is, um, like he lives, yeah, he lives outside of time, like, a day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. Yes, that is half of the answer, and that is really good. There is something else as well. In the, in the word of God in Matthew, God said, No one knows the hour or the time the Son of Man will come, except the Father in heaven. And he will come at a time when no one expects it, where people are eating and drinking and giving in marriage. So the answer is no, what John is saying. Okay. I'm with that as well. Some of you will have heard me ask this question before. So apologies if you've been through this before. If I was able to tell you absolutely conclusively that Jesus was coming back at half past three tomorrow afternoon, leave aside how I might know that, but if I was able to tell you without any shadow of doubt that Jesus was coming back at half past three tomorrow afternoon... Would it make any difference to the way you lived your life between now and then? Who thinks it would make a difference? Who thinks it should make no difference? Yeah. That's the whole point here. We should be living as though Jesus could come back at any moment. Because the fact is he could. Because no one knows the day or the hour. It could be half past three this afternoon. Anybody who's rushing in their head now thinking, but by half past three, I better get this sorted out with God. Uh, Yeah, get on with it now. We should be living all the time in that sense of the imminence of Jesus' return because the time is near. The time is near. Let's go on, verse... 11. I read verse 11 wrongly. Oh, well, I read it correctly, but I, I read it out of order just now. So, let the one who is doing harm continue to do harm. Let the one who is vile continue to be vile. Let the one who is righteous continue to live righteously. Let the one who is holy continue to be holy. Look, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes they will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat the fruit from the tree of life which remember is about eternal life outside the city are the dogs the sorcerers the sexually immoral the murderers the idol worshippers and all who love to live a lie these verses remind us of the reality That it's not what you say, it is what you do. It's not what you know, it's what you obey. It's not about you earning your way into heaven. None of us are good enough to do that. But it is about the fact that, as one writer put it, it's the quality of a person's life that shows what they really believe. 
It's the quality of someone's life that shows what they really believe. In other contexts, I've asked the question, if a Martian turned up and looked at your life, would they know that you're a Christian by what they observed? If you were charged with being a Christian, I've used this question in another context, would there be enough evidence to convict you? How is it in terms of what you do, how you behave? The phrase dogs here doesn't really do it for English people because we like dogs, don't we? You know, they're nice and cuddly, they're pets, have them in our houses. You know, they look at us with their big puppy eyes and we give them whatever they want, you know. In John's time, dogs were actually pariahs. They, they lived in the streets, they ate whatever they could get their teeth into. They were savage, they were to be feared Uh, They were no one's friend. They were scavengers on the edges of society. It's a very, very unpleasant image. Outside the city are the dogs. The sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idol worshippers, and all who love to live a lie, which is about hypocrisy. It's a reminder that uncleanness excludes people from the new creation. The phrase, washing their robes, another symbol. It stands for confessing sin and allowing God to cleanse. Because we can never be cleaned by our own devices. It's because of what Jesus has done, his forgiveness. There's another thing here that is quite striking. Um, You can enter the gates of the city and eat the fruit from the tree of life. In the Garden of Eden, it wasn't allowed. Now it is. It's a symbol of receiving eternal life, full knowledge of God. Let me read the last few verses of of the chapter. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this message for the churches. I am both the source of David and the heir to his throne. I'm the bright and morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears this say, come. Let anyone who is thirsty, come. Let anyone who desires to drink freely from the water of life. And I solemnly declare to everyone who hears the words of prophecy written in this book, if anyone adds anything to what is written here, God will add to that person the plagues described in this book. And if anyone removes any of the words from this book of prophecy, God will remove that person's share in the tree of life and in the holy city that are described in this book. He who is the faithful witness to all these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's holy I just want to pull one thing out of that section this morning. The call for Jesus to come is one of the very earliest recorded prayers we have in the New Testament and in the church. It is that word which um, Maranatha, which you may be familiar with, which means come. So, three key things that we, we take away from this passage this morning. Three really exciting things. All the consequences of what happened in the fall, described back in Genesis, are going to be undone. Amen? Everything will be undone. And we are going to have a perfect, clear transparent relationship with God. Amen? Therefore, now in the present, 
We live our lives obedient to our God. Amen. Steve. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.